Think of banking or Hollywood uh, or the US military. They spend tons of money. They gather tons of data <clears throat> in order to uh, help them guide how they operate. Think of healthcare. They spend tons and tons of money, four times what the military spends. You'd think they, we, must gather tons and tons of data. All of that money, all of those lives. But they don't. No other industry spends so much and tracks so little how it's spent. Here's one reason why. Divide healthcare into two parts. There's centralized healthcare, hospitals, major medical centers, the kinds of, the stuff of television shows, uh, what everybody thinks of. Think, uh, alternatively, of decentralized healthcare, clinics and offices and, uh, and health posts and, and little health centers all over the place. That is where the vast majority of healthcare is delivered. That's where the vast majority of healthcare money is spent. In the US, 85% of patient visits are not to hospitals, they're to uh, clinics and offices. There's 5,000 hospitals in the United States, hundreds of thousands of clinics. In the rest of the world, the number is much higher than 85%. Healthcare information technology systems, complex top-down systems, pretty much only exist in the centralized facilities. They have uh, the resources to do it, and they get their data. But next to no data flows from the vast majority of healthcare efforts, trillions of dollars, next to no feedback. Show me a system with poor feedback, and I'll show you tons of waste. When we walk, actually it's a pretty complex feat. Well, that's a pun, but I didn't mean it that way. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty complex activity. It is possible because of a system of feedback known as proprioception. Without it, we'd wobble and mostly go someplace other than intended. Tons of wasted effort. So what's going on at point of care? The non-centralized, the decentralized uh, part of healthcare. After all the arm waving and, and the graphs and the extensive studies, it still comes down to this, to one thing, actually one person, a health worker. If the health worker is not going to capture the data, and they're the only person you see there that's not the patient, if they're not going to capture it, you're not going to see the data. They're often overworked and undersupported, and they have their hands full just delivering health care. Next, they're asked at point of care also to do some diagnostics. This is actually a very humble technology, although I love it. It's called a rapid diagnostic test. Um, in contrast to tubes of blood and days of waiting, which is how conventional diagnostic testing works so far, these things take a finger prick of blood, as you can see, and then after 20 minutes or so, there's a color change on that strip. And when you read the color change, you get a positive or negative diagnosis. Very important because you meet and treat the patient before he or she leaves, as the other speaker just, just mentioned. It's critical. This is especially important in infectious diseases. These are transmissible illnesses. Over 50% of these transmissions are by people who didn't bother getting tested, or more worryingly, and this is a large number of them, people who go to get their blood drawn but never return to get the results. This is a problem all over the world. It's a problem in the US, in Russia, Africa, Asia, everywhere. 500 million of these wonderful little tests were sold last year and growing. They're incredibly inexpensive. I think average price these days is about 60 cents a, a test. Um, but they're tricky to do. If you process it correctly and you do all the things correctly, they have a wonderful accuracy, as high as, as reasonable laboratory tests, and yet they're done at point of care. You don't get such accuracy if they're done wrong. 
So back to the health worker. We're asking them to do now diagnostic testing. Now let's ask them also to collect data, to stop what they're doing and to record what they did. Predictable results, incomplete data, inaccurate data, sparse data, certainly untimely data. So the system, the vast amount of effort and money, the system juggernauts along nearly blind. Yet, every session between a patient and a health worker contains information gold, which if captured would in aggregate be invaluable to the healthcare system to understand what it's been doing and what it should do. Yet, most of this data is not captured and it is lost to the system. What if instead of asking the health wor workers to do something extra for us, we did something for them? What if we give them a device that helps them to do what they're supposed to do and what they want to do, which is to deliver care? To do that, we created a system called Fionet. It starts at the center there with mobile smart devices in the hands of health workers. A patient session, if you think about it, boils down to a structured Q&A. You ask a question, you get an answer, and that formulates uh, your way to a diagnosis, which also involves a test or two, and then treatment. Q&A, diagnosis, treatment, that's it. So the device provides the questions. The questions do not require prose, poetry answers. They're, they're really multiple choice. So the device provides the pick list of answers. The health worker just touches the correct answer and moves on. So the device accelerates the health worker through the workflow. But now that worker is touching a device over every bit of information exchanged. The device also can automatically and optically analyze these rapid diagnostic tests that I just mentioned. So it automatically diagnoses these RDTs, as they're called. And finally, it provides best practices and treatment algorithms, not by our lights, but by the managers of, of, of health systems. So different systems of our devices will be prescribing different treatment protocols because that's what the managers of those different healthcare systems feel is best. And that's cool, that's fine. We help them do what they do. We don't tell them what to do. All of this data is captured, encrypted, and compressed into less than 100 kilobytes so that it can be uploaded automatically. There's no send button on the device. Uploaded automatically to a cloud and uh, it can be done so because the data is so compressed over any cell network anywhere, anywhere in the planet. Very primitive cell networks, fine, no problem. Of course, it's all GPS tagged and, and, and time stamped. Managers um, can access that information in real time or any time, as can, on the other side, the, their authorized stakeholders. Um, funders or, or program managers via web portals. So instead of scant data taking months to get to where it's needed, tons of data arrives within minutes. So you could see the device, you could see the rapid diagnostic test, there's a little drawer, you pop it in. And you get a high quality, uh, very high quality optical read. Once a diagnosis is positive, there's a whole bunch more questions. Infectious diseases are called reportable because it's required to report them, which means that if there's a positive, I don't know, malaria or hepatitis or anything, there are 15 or 25 or 52 questions that that local jurisdiction government requires the health worker to ask. The health worker has to go and either ignore that or find a, um, a, a handbook and try to get to those questions. Naturally, the device, since it made the diagnosis, the correct questions are there, the pick list answers are there, boom, 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 and it accelerates the health worker through the right workflow. What it ends up capturing is patient information, health resource information, what's prescribed, 
epidemiology and demography. Product and market data, and if you think about it, health worker activity data, because they're using this. All the while, improving an individual patient's care and an individual health worker's capability, upscaling it. Using this system, guess what? Managers found error rates as high as 25% in um, how their health workers prepared rapid diagnostic tests. The managers who found this are sitting at their laptop or tablet in a Starbucks, pop open the computer, and popping at them is data from their clinic, which could be around the corner or around the world. They can in immediately intervene because the system allows the manager immediately to target a particular health worker in a particular moment, or maybe at the end of the day, and implement a correction. Um, Fionet identified in a number of places that as many as 20% of the patients received the wrong drug, by which I mean they had a negative diagnosis, they still received the drug, they had a positive diagnosis, they didn't receive the drug. This is not surprising. You can't treat what you don't diagnose. With this system, health workers reduce their error rates dramatically within the first nine weeks of use. The errors occurred in the first place, not because the health workers were bad or lazy or negligent. They were simply not getting feedback. Give them on the spot feedback and on its own, their performance dramatically improves. It's actually quite an optimistic finding. People want to do well, mostly. Fionet automatically aggregates all of this data and shows rolled up results to authorized program managers or funders or public health officers. This remarkable data is not here because someone paid for and implemented and then analyzed a complex study sampling a region. This data is here because it automatically flows from regular health workers doing their routine jobs. Where has this system been deployed? Naturally, decentralized healthcare places, uh, busy clinics, uh, military, civilian, government, private, uh, and, 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 and peripheral labs uh, everywhere. Remote communities. Even in private pharmacies, this is from uh, Accra, Ghana, and dispensaries, we are seeing a market forming when the guys that prescribe the drugs, or dispense them anyway, uh, can actually do testing on the spot and link it, and also people can then tra uh, track it. And we're seeing this where we come from in Canada, and, uh, and this picture is in Ghana, so that speaks to itself, for itself. When you link automated and streamlined data capture to clinical and diagnostic devices, you get a Niagara of data, to borrow a Canadian example. I guess it's also a US example. Uh, data is pumped at you by the routine activity that is already occurring in their hundreds of millions of times a day. Now, by delivering care, health workers are driving data. By utilizing the data, managers can vastly increase the effectiveness of the enormous resources they're already spending. There's plenty of money in the system. Malagasy is the language uh, of Madagascar. And fiovanana is a beautiful Mad Malagasy word. It means treating strangers like kin. More specifically, it means to do something for someone else, for another, first. Irrespective of any contingencies and quid pro quos, and then seeing what happens. In this sense, it also relates to the secret of getting data from health workers. Do something for them first. And it's the first two syllables of the word fiovanana from which we drew our company name. I've described the technology. 
I'm just as enthusiastic about the business model, which together with the technology is actually the solution, the real solution. We don't sell Fionet boxes like medical devices. We sell Fionet services like the mobile network operators, the cell phone carriers. We are totally inspired by mobile network operators. Uh, these people generated $1 trillion in revenue, I think it was 2012, when they crossed that line. They've demonstrated hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue in, in places where other, that other technology uh, industries wrote off. They came to frontier economies to do business, not just charity. The Organization of African Presidents said that the mobile cell phone industry did as much to uplift Africa as all the aid combined. Aid is great, partnerships are greater. 50% of the world's top growing economies for the past decade are now African countries. Africa is the world's number two market now in, cell phone, uh, in the cell phone sector, and it's on track to hit a billion subscriptions in 2015. High-tech healthcare, if fashioned appropriately, is next. Uh, lower middle income countries are already spending uh, nearly $2 trillion in healthcare. They need products and models that are globally appropriate, just like cell phone companies are. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who divide everything into two kinds and those who don't. I'm the second. It's not data versus care, it's data and care. It's not developed economies versus developing economies, it's both. It's not doing good versus doing well, it's both. Thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. So we've got a Moore's Law thing happening at the same time. So presumably the cost and the size, not just of the equipment, is going down, but the cost of doing a test is going down. So give us an idea of where we are in terms of the cost, say, of testing for malaria now and where you see it going in two, three, four years. Well, well that's the amazing thing. Um, the cost of, uh, of, a, of a malaria rapid diagnostic test is already in many places, 30 cents. It's, it's, it's really not the problem. Cost is now, a the, the per unit costs of these rapid diagnostic tests has just declined like crazy. And it's, it's driving their proliferation. We all remember what happened with chips when the cost of memory chips came down. It, it just went, but the problem with it is actually how it's used. They are, when you think of, they were designed or at least intended for a human being to read them. It's optically tricky to read and not so great to prepare. So if you have a reader read them instead of a human being, you'll actually see a much broader application of these rapid diagnostic tests. Incidentally, the technology we have also works with other kinds of tests, uh, molecular diagnostics and others. It's just that when you see 500 million of something in the world, you want to kind of get march in that parade. But in principle, uh, all diagnostic testing needs to uh, need, needs to hit the right price point, and, and we see that one of them ha already has done so. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Michael Greenberg. <laughs> <laughs>